Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. I'm Cassie James, as I've already been introduced to today. Uh, so, I was originally asked to talk about elementary, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, not directly, at least. So, instead, I'm going to talk about something that's a little more uh, universal, I think. But it also kind of will give you uh, some insight into how we think at elementary. Um, and then, if you do have questions specific to elementary, I can answer those at the end. Uh, first, a bit about me. So, I'm Cassie James. I'm UX architect. I'll get into that term later. Um, I'm a co founder of Elementary, as in Elementary OS. And I'm also a front end web developer and UX designer at uh, the Computer Manufacturer System 76. So, I've studied UX informally for about the past 10 years um, and formally for the past three. So, what is UX? We're going to talk about what UX is why it's essential to open source, and also how you can help ingrain it into your projects. So first, how do we define UX? Let's look at some textbook definitions. Uh, Nielsen Norman Group, a popular UX and usability design firm, says UX encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. Uh, Matthew McGain, who's the founder of uxmastery.com, calls UX the what, when, where, why, and how someone uses a product, as well as who that person is. My definition uh, is why someone, UX is why someone loves, hates, or is indifferent to your product. Um, and I think it's important to realize that every product, or really everything in the world, has a UX, it has a user experience. For example, if you go to the grocery store and the person checking you out is like super rude, you're having a poor user experience. You, as a user of the grocery store, are having a bad experience, and the grocery store should fix that. Um, and so it's also, when we say we care about UX, we're really saying we care about a positive UX or creating a positive user experience. Um, and I think it's also interesting to look at what UX isn't. Um, UX oftentimes get, gets lumped into these kind of other categories, and it might contain a bit, uh, uh, or it might be part of that category, but it's not really all or nothing, uh, as some people might think. So first and foremost, UX is not art. I like to define art as something that is created to evoke an emotion. Uh, for example, an artistic painting or photograph might be created to um, evoke a positive or negative or, or sad uh, feeling in a viewer. The composition, the subject, the lighting, uh, those are all, all carefully considered to make the uh, viewer feel something. And while ideally a positive user experience will evoke a positive emotion in the user, that's not the whole of what a uh, UX is. It's not just an art. Uh, a UX architect is not an artist. They, what they're doing is not art. It may contain art, but it's not just art. Uh, next, UX is not veneer. So veneer is like a thin layer of wood or finish that's added on at the end of building something. And its primary purpose is for looks, or sometimes to make the surface you know, smooth instead of rough. But veneer can't solve critical design flaws. For example, you build a really crappy chair, uh, you hand that off to the UX person to put the veneer on, there's only so much they can do to fix that chair. Uh, it might be fundamentally flawed, like when you sit in it, it breaks. Veneer's not going to fix that. And too often products are created in this way. They're designed and they're developed without a UX architect involved, and then they're kind of just handed off, and the UX architect is expected to fix all the problems by slapping some pretty design on top. And that just doesn't work. Next, UX is not UI. So UI, or user interfaces, uh, I like to define it as how an app or product looks. And that includes things like its theme, its widget styles, its buttons, its text entries, its icons, and how those things are arranged um, on a page, essentially. But UX actually starts much earlier than the UI. Uh, going back to one of our textbook definitions, so UX encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction. It's not just the user interface. Um, it's all interaction with the company, its services, and its products. A great example of this is a user trying to download a, uh, a timer app, let's say. So they find one on, on the web or an app store, and it looks gorgeous. You know, the UI of this app looks 
really, really pretty. So they install it. And then we, they go to use it, they're really impressed with uh, the UI. It's pretty, it has that you know, certain sheen to it, you know, it's trendy material design or whatever. But then they realize that the app only counts up, like a stopwatch. But what they wanted was something that counted down, like an egg timer. The app looks great, its UI is really nice, but now the user has had a negative experience because it doesn't solve the problem they were trying to solve. And the solution here isn't necessarily to make the app do what the user expected. Um, you know, if it's designed to be a really good stopwatch, it doesn't need to count down. Uh, one solution could be um, to make a more positive user experience, could be to make it more clear on that website or app store what the app is actually expected to do. Um, and ironically, by preventing that user from downloading the app, they're creating a better user experience. They're preventing a negative user experience, which creates a positive user experience. So it's not always just about the user interface, it's about the whole of the product. And right, next, UX is not usability. <clears throat> well, usability, or how easy something is to use, is absolutely a part of UX, but it's not the whole. You can have something that is extremely straightforward and usable, but that is just really ugly. My favorite example <laughs> is Craigslist. <laughs> It's uh, it's very usable. Like if you actually ever use it, it's very usable. It's well categorized. Things are simple to understand. It has high contrast. Like these, it's hitting all of the uh, usability keys. Um, but the user experience isn't always so great. Uh, for example, if you list something and then your email inbox explodes with spam, that's a bad user experience. Uh, if you're looking for a couch and you get to the page and you're scrolling through and, and the page is just ugly and it just doesn't make that couch feel attractive, that's a bad user experience. It might be perfectly usable, but the user isn't having as good of an experience as they, as they could be. Uh, lastly, UX is not accessibility. Uh, accessibility is extremely important to UX and it's something that's fairly well done in the open source world. But And for users who do rely on these optimizations, it's uh, <laughs> definitely a huge part of their user experience. But again, kind of the, the theme that you're getting is it's not the whole of UX. So we've gone over textbook definitions, what UX is not. Uh, ideally, it sheds some light on what UX is through those. Now let's take a look at, uh, what, at UX and how it's actually approached in the real world, or UX in practice. First up, the enterprise. UX in the enterprise is lagging significantly behind other areas. Uh, I recently had someone reach out to me who develops enterprise software and told me his enterprise clients were not looking for a strong UX, it just needs to work. Wow. Uh, basically that tells me those enterprise clients need to be educated on what UX is. Uh, they're saying one thing, that it doesn't need a strong UX, but that it just needs to work. Uh, they, they should come join us here and sit down and learn what UX is. Um, another argument I've heard is that large companies can just you know, pay billions of dollars to tra train every single employee that will ever have to use their crappy software. And that that's a good experience, or a good uh, replacement for a good user experience. Maybe they didn't phrase it exactly like that, but that sort of mentality is pretty prevalent. Uh, they think training can supplant a good UX uh, just by training somebody on the crappy software that obviates the need for a good good software in the first place. And this is actually costing them a lot of money. The Association for Talent Development did a study of 340 diverse organizations of various sizes and found that on average over $1,200 per employee is being spent on training. And this is basically on training that could be prevented if it had a good user experience in the first place. And imagine if you took that $1,200 per employee and multiply it by the number of employees in an organization, and then spend that on UX designers, uh, you'll end up with probably a much better product. Plus, even lower training costs, because you wouldn't have to replace people who quit due to the crappy software, <laughs> which is actually a thing. People, uh, one of the top cited sources of uh, quitting enterprise positions is crappy enterprise software. So there's, there's a lot of potential here. Um, further, the IEEE found that five to 15 percent of enterprise projects are scrapped due to poor UX. This is a huge chunk of wasted resources just thrown out. Uh, and ba so basically, I guess, the whole point is that UX in the enterprise is seriously behind, and it's costing enterprise companies a ton of money. 
So to kind of flip to the opposite end of the spectrum, let's take a look at UX in practice in startups. So wildly successful startup companies think UX first. They care about the whole user experience, the whole experience a user has from first hearing about the product to hopefully using it every single day, and then on through to how to monetize the product down the road. And this is particular, particularly important to startups because their, uh, their first goal is to gain adoption and quickly. It's kind of the, the trend we see with startup companies. And a critical point in a startup's life is how they will monetize so they can keep building things for their users, but without sacrificing the UX that got the users there in the first place. A successful startup will have built their business strategy into the UX. And if they go to try tap monetization on after the fact, it's either going to kill their UX or they'll have to completely redesign, which again is a huge waste of money and resources. Uh, so business strategy and how that affects the users must be a large part of startup's UX. And just as large is the user's experience interacting with the brand itself. This is if you follow any startups on like Twitter or social media, I mean, you see this a lot. If, uh, if users the user's experience interacting with the brand inside and outside of the product via social media support um, or even advertising. If user loves the product but gets ignored or blown off by the support team, that's going to be a net negative user experience. It affects their experience with the brand and the product, even though it's outside of the product itself. If a company comes out with a distasteful or offensive ad, that directly affects people's perception of the brand and the product, and that can lead to a negative user experience. On the other side, if a user gets you know, super fast and actually helpful responses on social media or via email, that's a hugely positive user experience, and that affects how the product is perceived as a whole. And I love it when I go on Twitter, I, I tweet at some company, and half the time I'm expecting it just kind of goes out there into the Twitterverse. But I get like a really fast response, and it's actually targeted towards me, and it actually solves my problem. I'm much more likely to recommend that product or to, to use it even more, because it's like, hey, they actually care about me. So lastly, let's take a look at probably the most familiar uh, field here, which would be open source. Now, open source, as we probably all know, is awesome. <laughs> Anyone can take existing code, uh, solve their own problem, and then kind of give it back to the world. That's really cool. However, this can create a lot of UX problems. If, for example, if an open source project is designed to scratch a particular person's itch, especially a, say, fairly technical user who understands open source and computer programming, that solution might not provide the best experience for other people who are maybe less technically advanced. And to counter this, uh, often open source developers uh, decide that they should let the user set up the tool how it should best serve them. So you end up with you know, a whole page of configuration options in every single uh, open source tool. The problem here is obviously that the developer is just passing the design process on to the end user. They're basically forcing the user to make decisions that the designer or developer should have made and worked out ahead of time. In addition, they're, creating, they're actually creating an exponentially more complex uh, cross testing process by increasing the combinations of configurations that can be involved, and that's uh, less time they can work on actually building new features or improving existing features. And lastly, too often in open source, developers are building without an architect. So I said I would get back to the phrase open source for UX architect. So let's have some story time. <laughs> Little sidebar. I'm tell you about Xander the architect. My wife and I are also, in addition to our day jobs, uh, we're Airbnb hosts. So we invite strangers into our home in exchange for some money and we promise that they won't murder us in sleep. <laughs> uh, and it, it's working out pretty well. We're not dead yet. <laughs> and recently we had this awesome guest named Xander and he was an architect. He uh, specialized in restoring or remodeling these historical homes, keeping in mind their original designs and styles but making them more livable for uh, modern families. So they would look like historically accurate, but you know, the kitchen would actually be big enough to walk around in. And the way he first explained it, I thought he was an interior designer. Uh, it sounded like you know, he was brought in after a renovation was done to kind of decorate in the style of the original architecture, but he quickly corrected me. He was an architect, not an interior designer. 
Uh, he, he was actually involved before the renovation began and played a key role in actually planning it out. He has studied architecture styles from various eras and has some artistic ability, but his expertise was in listening to the needs of the client or family and figuring out how to create a space that best served them, but also stayed true to that original architecture. Now, he wasn't a construction worker. He wasn't the one like putting up two by fours and laying flooring. And he wasn't an engine, he wasn't the engineer. It wasn't his job to know exactly you know, what technical specifications of every single building material needed to be, or the finite details of how it would be built. However, he, was, he did deeply understand those people and he worked alongside them, which is part of what made him a great architect. In case you haven't figured it out, Xander is to historical renovations as UX designers are to products. A UX designer is not just a visual designer. They're not the interior decorator. Their job isn't to be brought in after the thing is built to make it look pretty. They serve a key role in actually planning out the product. They've studied various interfaces, and yes, they likely have some artistic ability, but their expertise is actually in listening to the needs of users and figuring out how to create a product that best serves them and the product stakeholders. They're not the developer who's actually creating the product, and they're not the engineer who's making technology decisions, but they do deeply understand those people and they work alongside them to create a better product. Now imagine if somebody in Xander's role didn't exist during one of these renovations. The family could drop what they thought was, uh, you know, what they would like, and, but they don't really have the technical expertise or the knowledge of, of the uh, historical style to, to get it to look exactly right. And then the construction workers would get these plans and they'd have to kind of try to filter out what the family was actually asking, which would probably change over time. I'm sure we've all been there in software projects. Uh, and then they have to try to make, turn that and build an actual workable product. And the engineer might be able to you know, help them out and identify what type of materials to use and uh, ensure the final renovation is up to code. But without the architect and the blueprints, they're really flying blind and making it up as they go. If they're lucky, they might end up with a livable space. But it's probably going to be something that's not well designed. And most likely, they end up redoing work that could have been avoided if they had an architect like Xander guiding them. So this is the face. This is the problem we face in software projects, open source or not, every day. We have insanely talented people with exceptional technical knowledge and ability, and we build workable products. But too often, there isn't an architect who's drawing the blueprints before development begins and guiding the process as it happens. This means we don't pay enough attention to platform guidelines and conventions. Uh, we don't listen to, study, and work to understand end users. And we end up wasting a lot of time on redoing things. And this is why we need UX architects, not just UX designers. That's why I like this term a lot more than designers. So there's the sidebar about Xander the architect. <laughs> on that note, let's look at what UX should be. UX should be the why. It's not just the what or the surface, but it's the reasoning behind the UI. Like an architect who designs a building with a world of knowledge of the architecture type and how the family is going to use it, uh, a UX architect must think through the why, uh, the how and the why of a user will use product. Next, uh, positive user experience should be uh, part of your strategy. It goes all the way back to the goals and products the goals of the product and the stakeholders, whether that's a ragtag group of friends on the internet, like a lot of open source projects, or even a, um, you know, a corporate funder, they needed to uh, have UX as part of their strategy. It's nearly impossible to create a positive user experience if the core goals of the product do not include elements such as simplicity, usability, and desire or de delight. And those core goals of simplicity, usability, and desire should permeate a project. It should be, UX should be pervasive. Everyone involved, whether it's the UX architect, the developer, the engineer, a marketer, a social media manager, or anybody, they must always be thinking of the user throughout every part of the process. The effort to create a positive user experience must be involved at every step. So to finally get back to the subtitle of the talk, why is UX essential to open source, specifically? So I think, first and foremost, let's be honest, it's, uh, it helps us compete with closed source software. Uh, developing a positive user experience doesn't always cost a lot of money. Um, 
as you know, we might think. As we saw earlier, we're talking about the enterprise that actually can save money in the long run. Uh, and I know oftentimes open source projects are underfunded, and this is one way we can combat that. is by focusing on positive user experience and uh, reducing the development costs. In addition, open source development is more agile. Uh, ideas developed in the open, ideas are developed in the open and can more quickly react to the changing landscape than a lot of closed source projects. Um, and keeping, by keeping those UX findings and developments out there in the open, we can actually compete with closed source by trading ideas to and from other community projects that are out in the open source world. And you can actually see this in action in the uh, Linux des desktop environment right now. Uh, not only are projects like GNOME, KDE, and Elementary uh, learning from what closed source projects are doing, uh, like OS X or Windows, but we're actually learning from and improving on the ideas of one another. So by keeping all of this, this development and thinking in the open, we can actually iterate faster. Next, uh, UX helps open source be accessible to all. And I don't mean the uh, traditional open the accessibility, but a focused user experience can help lower the barrier to entry, especially for non-tech savvy users. Um, it also lets us create a cleaner user interface, which means simpler documentation, which can mean fewer translations. Um, so it can kind of help throughout the whole stack. And all of this actually helps the product get out of the way, even for more advanced users. It's, it's not just for these less tech savvy users. Uh, more advanced users can use a more streamlined product which means uh, less time fiddling with the product and more time actually using it and getting things done. Uh, similarly, UX is essential to open source because it can vastly improve your code base. The focus, that focused user experience means less, kind of, kind of like last step, uh, less UI to develop, which in turn mean, means there's less code to maintain, uh, which can you know, result in a leaner co code base. And we see this all the time in elementary. A lot of times we look to see if there are, actively look to see if there are ways that we can get rid of code by making the UX better. So it's, you know, we look at a process and say, well, from a code perspective, we're kind of doing things backwards here. And that probably means they're doing it backwards uh, as a user as well. Can we, can we turn that up on both sides? Um, this also means there's less to break. Um, there's fewer combinations of configurations, fewer variables to test against. Uh, which in turn can help you develop better, faster code. And it also gives you more time to implement the features you actually care about. So, we've answered, what is UX? We've covered uh, my text the textbook definitions, my definition, what it's not, how it looks in practice, why we should call UX people, architects, remember Xander, uh, what UX should be, and why it's essential to open source. And we could stop here, but I feel like there's one more essential piece of the puzzle, uh, particularly for open source. And that's how do you ingrain UX into an open source project? So this is oftentimes the biggest hurdle with an open source project. The most effective way is to, have you, to ensure that there are UX architects at the leadership level of the project. Uh, their job is to ensure that the focus on a positive user experience is pervasive through the project. Uh, and with a UX architect as a major stakeholder in the project, you'll have jumped one of the biggest hurdles to creating a positive UX, which is getting the stakeholders on board that it's a good idea anyway. And this is something we've seen a lot of success with, both inside and outside of open source. Um, in open source, you have major projects like Elementary OS, GNOME, um, who have designers very high up within the projects themselves, and they're ensuring the team is constantly thinking about the user and their experience. Um, so th these projects are constantly improving. Then you have uh, companies like Google. Uh, Google recently did like a complete 180 design-wise, and they did this by elevating designers within their organization, promoting them, and developing a whole new design language with a huge focus on user experience. It has changed the company from the top down. And Apple, the most profitable company in the world, has designers at the very top who help shape their entire product strategy and user experience from the top down. This is the most effective way you can ingrain UX into a product, is by having UX architects at the leadership level. Barring that, you can also hire on a UX design firm or UX architects. Um, and it's important to try to do this as early as possible in a product, on a project. 
Um, remember Xander, the architect. We will not forget Xander. <coughs> um, you need someone who's there to look at the process from the beginning and help design the whole experience. So it's important that they exist early on in the life of a project. And paying this person is just as important as paying developers. They will pay a huge role in determining the success or failure of your project. Um, too often I think we see some of the first people in an open source project to get you know, on a payroll are developers because they're the ones writing the code. Uh, but it's really important to remember that the earlier you have a UX team, the uh, earlier you can actually make things uh, with a good UX. Here's an easy one. Treat, treat, treat UX issues as critical bugs. Uh, a poor user experience is just as critical as a seg fault. It's, they both leave a nasty taste in the user's mouth, and they make it more likely that they're going to go look somewhere else. Um, Daniel Foray, the lead UX designer of Elementary, likes to say that if the feature is too hard to use, then in the eyes of the user, that feature is broken or doesn't even exist. So you should treat these things as if the feature is completely broken if it has a poor UX. And these UX bugs need to be uh, need to have thorough solutions, not just ugly workarounds or hacks. Never fix a UI or a UX bug through documentation <laughs> or a message telling the user that they're doing something wrong. That's terrible. I, I, ideally, these uh, bugs will be fixed by actually making it so the user can't actually accidentally do the wrong thing. Next, a very effective way to ingrain UX into an open source project is by always leaving UX first. This is kind of echoing some things from earlier. Uh, start with the user's experience and then work backwards to the technical solution. Don't start by trying out some new technology and then trying to figure out a reason to use it. It's like you're creating a solution and then saying, okay, now where's the problem? Uh, and this is backwards. And really, this is this is kind of a common thing. Like I said, echoes earlier points. Uh, it's a central tenet of all the previous points. It's think UX first. Lastly, kind of similarly, is remember to continue to perform UX tasks as your product evolves. It's not just a one-time consideration. You have to always be designing, always thinking about UX. Um, if you're implementing a new feature, test that new feature, get user feedback. Uh, users don't always have the right solutions. Oftentimes, they'll tell you how they think it should work, and your task is actually to figure out why they think it should work that way, and then design a solution that will work for all uh, or for most users. But it's important to remember that you must do this constantly as your product is evolving. It's not just something you do at the beginning to design your product and then go make it. Um, you're constantly reevaluating, testing, tweaking. So, to recap, what is UX? It's why someone loves, hates, or is indifferent to your product. Why is UX essential to open source? Uh, it's because it helps you compete with closed source software. Uh, it helps you be more accessible to everyone, and you can help, it can help you improve your focus. And how do you ingrain UX into an open source project? Uh, making sure there are UX people in the leadership, hiring those UX people early, treating UX issues as critical bugs, thinking UX first, and then always continuing to perform UX tasks through the lifetime. Um, yeah, any questions about anything I covered, or uh, me, or things in general, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, one question I have. From your experience, um, if you were to say from a hiring manager's perspective, what would you look for in someone to know that they're good at, at being a UX architect? <coughs> um, yeah, that's a really great question. I think too often, I like to use UX architect, thank you. Remember saying um, I think too often these people are looked at as creative people of kind of, um, I heard an article, I wish I had it on hand. Um, you know, designers are not just these like creative geniuses that go away in the room and just come up with something brilliant and then that's, you know, that's how it works. Sometimes it feels that way, um, but ideally uh, a good UX architect would be someone who has very solid problem solving skills and knows how to listen to people. I, mean, I think. I think the biggest thing is listening to users and then distilling what the users are actually saying into solutions, rather than just saying, well, our user, the top requested feature is this thing, so we need to build this thing. That's not the right way to do it. Um, the top requested user is, or the top requested feature is this thing, 
why is that the top requested feature? Could we make it so that feature is actually not even needed and is built in uh, closer to the core of the product? So I think that's listening to people, um, distilling, distilling uh, ideas into the reasoning behind those ideas. Those would be core things to look for. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got a whole list of potential <laughs> questions here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you say a, a UX architect is similar to like a designer for a company? Yeah, so um, the way I like to look at it, basically the term that is used out there in the real world is UX designer. Um, there is a difference between, I think, a, a creative designer or a UI designer and a UX person. Um, for example, at System76, we have a uh, brand designer who is also the web designer, um, and she is she's mostly on the creative side of things of if she designed those stickers, for example. Um, very, very much on the like typical designer, what you would think of as a designer type person, um, more on the artistic side. But a UX person is more on the, um, it's almost like, psych it's almost a psychology. Um, it's a mix of uh, art, psychology, and technical knowledge that kind of create the, a perfect UX person. Um, that's why I, was, I like the term UX architect is if you think of an architect in a, in a building project, uh, they're not just the interior designer. They're not, you know, picking out the pillows and the couch. They're actually designing the foundation of the building and the actual walls and where the rooms go in the building. Um, they're not just doing the paint colors. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's uh, some things that I've been reading in the past where a lot of people were complaining that designers were finding their way to the top of companies. But now I can see that you meant as in, you know, like not just designers, but you mean the actual people who have their hand and what people actually see when they use a product and mm -hmm. not what people associate the product as, essentially. Yeah. Well, in yeah. a different way, rather. Like mm -hmm. people were complaining that people that are using uh, Apple products, they're, they're declining in, in constructive, you know, like new, new products and things that are fun and cool to use and are just focusing more on the Mac look that's coming out and everything. Mm. But, so I can right, that. design for design's sake is, is not always a good thing. Um, I kind of think I poked fun at material design, which I'm actually a huge fan of, by the way, <laughs> uh, which is why I like to poke fun at it. Uh, but there, there is this trend of, um, you know, doing, doing a redesign because it looks outdated and we want to make it look newer, that's bad. <laughs> You should do a redesign if there are problems with using your product, and those the redesign you do shouldn't just be a skin over the top of it. It should be uh, considering how it gets put together and, and where the functions are and how those functions work, not just the skin on top. I was, was going to say I think like a like a laptop is a, is an excellent example of like how a UX architect could come because you have like essentially it's two pieces. You have like hardware and you have software, mm -hmm. so you've got incredible. You know, software on there, but if you have crappy hardware, like, yeah, it's not going to work. Uh, yeah, you know, or even if like the hardware is incredible and the software is crappy, that's not going to work. So, or even right. it's, like something simple, like for example, like uh, like say like a volume button. You know, like I feel like a UX architect would be like, oh, well, you know, let's have the volume button here, like on in the software, and also have the physical hardware button and do yeah. the same thing. So I feel like I don't know, I don't know if that's a good description or not. Yeah, well, I think similarly. Um, at System76, kind of going back to that experience that I've had, uh, we think of our UX of our product starting, um, again, like basically from the first time the com somebody hears about the company. Yeah. So that involves our brand messaging, our brand design, our social media accounts, our website, the ordering process, the support process, the packaging. You know, these are all parts of the UX of our laptops, for example. Um, we consider the box a huge part of the UX. We completely designed our own custom packaging, which was a lot of fun. Um, because we want it, when you open up the box, we want you to see the laptop front and center and to have a little welcome thing that you know invites you into the kind of this growing family of System76 users and we want to give you warm fuzzies. And that's that's all a part of the UX of the laptop. Um, but then in addition, yeah, the software is part of the UX, but the hardware is also part of that. If it if the software is beautiful and runs really well, but your fingers hurt after typing on the keyboard, that's a bad UX. 
So it's, it's kind of the uh, all-encompassing. When you think back to what UX stands for, user experience, it's the experience they have using something or interacting with something. Yeah, yeah. If there's a problem in software that can't be solved always in software, then that's where if you have the same UX designer working with both the hardware and software team, you can kind of alleviate those things. Yeah. I'm curious. So System76 is a website. Is it different? Um, very different. Um, did you have any part of that? What do you mean different? Like different from how it used to be? Or? Yes, it's completely different. Just going to it now, it just looks different, it feels yeah. different. So I'm curious if you had a part of it, if you could talk mm -hmm. a little bit about like, some of the ideas that went into that, so we can kind of see a practical example. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, about two years ago, I think, um, uh, System 76 hired on Kate, our designer, um, and then a couple months after she started, they hired me on as the front of the developer and UX designer. Um, and so she she's in charge of, she was, actually her first task was the new branding. So we completely um, rethought how the brand, kept the name, but that's about it, <laughs> um, as far as branding goes. Um, rethought how, like what feelings people want to have when they see our brand. Um, and that's kind of, uh, we, can, there we, go. Um, we kind of have this kind of system design across not only the logo, but our typography on the website. Um, and this has been a hugely evolving process over the last couple of years. Um, we had a first redesign about a year ago, I think, um, after a lot of work, pouring a lot of work into it, and then we kind of launched a 2.0 version of the new website uh, a couple months back with a new home page and some new pages. Uh, trying to think of, of what exactly we go over with that. I think a lot of times it starts with um, Kate thinking about the, the aesthetic she wants to evoke and the, and the feeling she wants to evoke. Um, and then a lot of times we'll work together and, and she'll iterate several different designs and then we'll kind of throw them on a board and, and say like, does, is this, does this make us feel how we want someone to feel when they come to our site? For example, on the homepage, when we were doing this redesign, we wanted people to feel um, like anxious or giddy almost, like that they, they could build something, they could make something. Um, and so we kind of focused on that maker idea with this video of, um, not only is it, yes, that's actually a tech putting a, hard, a graphics card into one of our actual computers, but it's also that idea of, you know, when you get your computer, like, you can tear the side off of it and put it, throw a new graphics card in there. Or, um, here's, that's actually Kate. <laughs> you know, she's designing something and she's using her laptop for, for reference, and so she's using um, our product to help her create something. Here we're using a laser, which I think powered by Ubuntu on one of our laptops or our desktops, and it's just this, this whole feeling of it's different people making and building and putting things together. Um, and so we kind of constantly reevaluate, like, is that the feeling that we're giving off um, when people visit the site? Um, yeah, so it's, as far as the website goes, goes Kate's more, um, she does most of the design work, but then she works closely with both her CEO, uh, me and some other people on the team to feel, you know, make sure it feels the way we want it to feel. And once we kind of decide that's the route we want to go, then after when we start actually building it. Um, and I think more of my UX expertise comes in when it comes to things like, will people think that that thing is clickable, but it's not? Will people think that it, you know, isn't clickable, but it is? Uh, and just kind of always double checking and cross-referencing with the visual designer to make sure those things are good. Um, one example, I guess, that's kind of interesting. Let's go configure a laptop. Uh, so our, we call this our configurator, or the design and buy section. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, a thing that we had a lot of difficulty, but also fun designing, uh, because we wanted to make sure that it would be fully responsive. Okay. Uh, so example, when you pull up on a phone, you get uh, this like step-by-step -step process. This is a little taller than a phone would be. Um, but you can click through, or on a phone, you can swipe side to side through the steps. Um, and it's it's all the same content, 
on a phone versus a computer. So you can you can configure a like twelve thousand dollar server on your phone and buy it if you want, and it is just as easy as doing it on your computer. Uh, which we were talking about, it's actually really important to us. Um, we see a lot of users who are getting their first computers uh, from us. They have a smartphone, but they don't have a laptop. And so they're actually ordering their computer from their phone. And uh, I think we have one of the easiest ways to do that on the internet right now. Uh, but this was, you know, the UX kind of changes between a mobile and a, and a desktop. But the content's all the same. This idea of you have kind of these permanent buttons at the top of the page, uh, that wouldn't really work as well on, on a desktop. On a desktop, you're more used to just kind of scrolling. But here it's, it's segmented. Here's your step, choose the thing, next step, choose the thing, next step. So this is a, a took a lot of iterations, and we, we actually had paper prototypes, which were a lot of fun. If you've never done paper prototypes, I highly recommend it. It's fun, but it also actually really helps you feel like you're interacting with something before building it. Um, literally sketching things out on paper and then like moving them around as if you would move it. We sketched all the different steps you know, on a white piece of paper and then had like a little phone frame and then said, okay, tap here. <laughs> Tap here, <laughs> and it gets it solves animation. It solves um, keeping the experience feeling like a, it's tactile. Um, so yeah, this is a, a really fun new project that we did pretty early on. I, was doing. I, I definitely I think it works because I remember going through the ordering process. Um, this is having this a long time ago, and it was not fun at all. And most honestly, most hardworking websites, anything that they're selling, HP's website, Devil, they're selling HP is website, devil, they're all crap. Crap and <laughs> once it's out, it just feels it feels natural and it feels like mm -hmm. any other modern system and it's just it's just it looks so much nicer, it works so much nicer. I didn't realize you can slide and mold, so that's awesome too. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where uh, we made sure it wasn't the only way. I don't think gestures should ever be the only way to interact with something unless it's insanely obvious that's the way to do it. Um, that's why we have buttons at the top. But when they tap it and they see it physically moving that way. Um, we would see the first thing somebody would do is they'd go to go backwards and they would swipe it backwards. And then boom, they just learned a shortcut. And we didn't have to teach it to them. They just learned it. So it's kind of uh, teaching that user how to be more efficient without explicitly saying, by the way, you can swipe back and forth, you know. Um, that kind of plays into the brand new website. Is that JavaScript or CSS transition? On mobile or on mobile? Um, oh, it's been so long since I looked at that code and I want to rewrite it all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's CSS transition. Um, yeah, it's a transform. It's a 2D transform. So I think we're using some sort of a uh, some sort of swipe library to get it consistent across multiple devices. So are you doing a media queries then for like 640 screen width or something? Yeah, so we use a um, foundation, which is uh, for a bootstrap. It's kind of similar. Um, it's created by a company called Zerb. Um, it's pretty similar where they have built in media queries. We kind of tweaked it to work exactly the way we want. We had one in called Snablet, which is for small tablets. Because <laughs> we were finding that the, the predefined phone interface looks really bad on a seven inch tablet, but you couldn't squish the you know, 10 inch tablet and interface down to a seven inch tablet. And there are some times you only want to have two things next to each other on a tablet, but uh, and, you know, this way on a phone. Um, so it's, but it is, yeah, it's, it's based on media queries and uh, pixel widths. Yeah, I read, um, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I read somewhere that um, cause a lot of people, when you have media queries, they set their breakpoints, but they just have, kind of like what you said, they have breakpoints, like this is the one for the phone, whatever. But I read somewhere they said, they suggested maybe not doing that and starting with a smaller size and just creating mm -hmm. breakpoints as they're needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because sometimes you may not need it and people end up creating all these arbitrary breakpoints for no reason, yep. where just, once the light looks like, all right, this is getting a little weird, you kind of need to change something, then they say, that's where you should create the breakpoint instead of just what the iPhone breakpoint might be and then the tablet breakpoint. Okay. And we, we do that as well with, we still have a few like defined points, but we don't always change something at every one of those points. We, we always look at it, um, at least the way I, I always look at it is mobile first. So I said, okay, if everything was on a phone and it was this really tall skinny screen, like how would that look? And so that's how I, all, I put it all together. And then I say, okay, once we have enough room, can we pull this thing up next to it? Um, can we, you know, make this picture actually take up a little bit more space because we have a bigger a bigger display and things are scale based. They aren't always set like at exact pixel dimensions. We use um, VH and VW for you CSS people, if you know what that is. It's basically a percentage of the uh, viewport height or viewport width. So um, on a 27 inch high DPI display, 
you'll have you know, a big hero image that takes up on the um, homepage. That video at the homepage is that way, or this is that way. Um, if I you know, zoom out on my computer, it still takes up the same relative proportion of space because we're not saying it takes up this exact amount of pixels, we're saying it takes up this amount of space on your screen. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can kind of combine CSS things to make a responsive site. And something I've started to do more recently is, is basing things not just on hard pixel sizes or, or dimensions, but more on uh, proportions. So yeah.